Have you been around individuals that have the topic of the coming of Jesus on their mind in almost every conversation? They talk about it, they read about it, they're concerned about it. How often do you hear people talk about, well, these must be the last days, and they go back to Matthew 24, which is another subject for another time. Matthew 24 is one of the most misused passages, perhaps, in the New Testament. But the idea of, let's, let's talk about when the end of the world is going to take place, it's not a new phenomenon. It's, it's something that actually can trace back to those early days of Christianity. You had Christians that were trying to figure out, when's Jesus going to come back? How long is it going to take? So much so that in the Greek city of Thessalonica, one of the reasons Paul writes two letters to them is to help correct the misconceptions they have about the return of Jesus. He mentions it in the first Thessalonians, but he, he really talks about it in the second Thessalonians. So for the few moments we have together on this occasion, I'd like to talk about 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And notice what he says to these Christians, beginning in verse 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of perdition. And we'll talk about his description of that individual a bit later on, but I want to notice a phrase that he uses in verse 2. Do not be soon shaken in mind or troubled, whether by spirit, your attitude, or by word, or by letter. What kind of focus do you possess? If I'm overly concerned about this topic, that means I'm leaving other topics in my life that are very pertinent to my growth as a Christian untouched. Or at best, I may be talking about them in, in minimal instances. To focus on just one thing to the exclusion of everything else that God talks about as far as what we need to do to be obedient to him, how we need to live, how we strive to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. If I'm concerned about reading and talking and thinking about through the second coming of Christ more than anything else, I'm missing the whole point. What he tells these Christians is, don't be shaken about that. That's not the focus. Do not be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us. And he tells them that that's not going to happen until certain other things happen. Well, that's where we kind of get in a situation where people try to figure things out today. Sometimes using Matthew chapter 24, which is talking about the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. In verse number 3 and following, he actually does describe this individual of lawlessness, this son of perdition. Verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. In verse 5, he reminds them, Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? This is not the first time these Christians have heard this, but they keep hanging on to it. Verse 7 and verse 8. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. It really doesn't say like it's going to be a, a huge battle, does it? It sounds like the the individual that's setting himself up as God is no match for Jesus the Christ. But in the context of all of this, does Paul say, I want you to worry about this, watch about this, be concerned about this? No. In fact, it's when you talk about who, who is not the important thing. What? that individual does is really what's significant. In verse 9, the very first part of verse 10, look at what Paul writes. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. That's the what. It's, it's, it's um, an imitation of what Christianity should be. It's putting other things in the place of it. Back in the writing that he had to the Christians in Corinth, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul wrote this. He's talking about individuals, he classifies in verse 13 as false apostles, deceitful workers, 
transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Not everybody who professes Christianity is really a Christian. There are individuals that have tremendous following that mm, are leading people down the wrong path. And if I look at verses and take them out of their context and make them say what I want them to say, then that's part of the problem. So the, the what of this taking place, the what that this individual is doing, again, the working of Satan with power, signs, lying wonders, unrighteous deception among those who perish. Why is that even possible? It's possible because of the second half of verse, verse 10. Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. I want to listen to what I really want to hear. Don't challenge me. I want to be accepted for myself just the way that I am. I don't want to grow. I don't want to change in any kind of way that takes my significance for my desires and my wishes out of the picture. The idea of being a servant to humanity, the idea of being a servant of Christ, I don't want that. There's the problem. Individuals that did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. We've talked in times past about certain passages and chapters, paragraphs of chapters even, that, that deal with the mindset that the child of God really has. The concern for investigating everything, testing everything, analyzing everything, holding on to what's good, having an appreciation for other people where you don't set yourself up on a pedestal. In this particular situation, these individuals are concerned, more concerned about trying to figure out the return of Jesus than they're thinking about living in the way that God wants them to live toward one another. In verse 11 and verse 12, how does this all happen? How, how does it take place? God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had a pleasure in unrighteousness. Truth keeps showing up. The idea of a blind faith we talked about before, that's not true Christianity. The idea of accepting something just because I hear it, that's not true Christianity. Analyzing things as best I can and looking at the evidence, that's what really has to be involved. Not being overly concerned with what happens at the end of time, be concerned about what's happening today. Be aware of the way that I need to be living today. So in verse 11 and verse 12, in this kind of concept, the focusing on what individuals are saying that sounds so sensational that that just, man, that's just kind of scary. That's awesome. That's, that's intriguing. I'm going to focus on that. That's exactly what individuals want you to do who do not want you to live according to God's word. That sounds kind of strange to say that in religious circles, but it's true. Now look at verse, um, verse 13 and 14. What's the solution? We are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved of the, by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. And don't misunderstand what he says about chosen for salvation because he gives two classifications or categories or elements involved in that. One is sanctification of being set apart by the Spirit of God. And, and how, how does that happen? How does the Spirit do that? In Ephesians, Paul describes the, the Word of God as the sword of the Spirit, um, the message of the Spirit, as it were. Through that message and belief of the truth, those two phrases go hand in hand, sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Chosen by God, but I'm chosen by God because I have listened to this message, applied it, analyzed it, and become committed to it. Verse 14, to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So take those three, those three things together, chosen for salvation, sanctification in the spirit, belief of the truth, because we're called by the gospel of Christ. Verse 14, not some kind of special voice that I hear, but the gospel of Jesus Christ that I find contained in this word. 
Remember, how does how does this Antichrist actually work? How does this this man of lawlessness or perdition actually focus the minds of individuals? Take them off of what Scripture says. If I can't find it in God's Word, should I be following it in the first place? We're surrounded by individuals that have a tremendous desire to know when is the end going to be rather than how do I live today. We need to help them focus on what is most significant. The admonition, the close of this chapter, verse 15 through 17. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or epistle. Word for tradition means the precepts, the instruction that you received. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who's loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Do not be consumed about trying to figure figure out when Jesus is coming back. Just live for him every day. It's better to be ready than to worry about when. We're surrounded and will continue to be surrounded by people that are really enamored by that topic. And I hope we have opportunity to share with them that the most important topic is not trying to figure out when Jesus is coming back, but figuring out how do you live for him today in accordance with this inspired book. Please stay safe. We'll talk again soon.